No, did I just right click? You can push the button or you can I'll just push the button. <laughs> I'm just gonna button that. <laughs> okay, so this is the APA definition of trauma, right? So when danger poses a direct or indirect threat for a child, um, this can be a source of psychological distress. And so that signifies trauma. The issue is, is that more children are being exposed to traumatic events nowadays. And so everybody's heard of the ACEs, right? The adverse childhood experiences. So <clears throat> I'll just take that as a yes. <laughs> um, so the adverse, everyone talks about the adverse childhood experiences. That's exposure to trauma. That's a nationwide study that was done that identified, um, you know, that children <laughs> Who are exposed early on to adverse experiences, the higher it's a it's a ten item scale, and the higher they rate, the higher risk they are at um, major health risks and early death. And so, that's a big concern because children are being exposed more and more to different traumatic experiences, and when they have that adverse childhood experience, it leads to that um, the social, emotional, and cognitive delays, as well as you know. Um, increased uh, risk for diseases, and like I said, early death. In West Virginia, in 2018, West Virginia um, children were 26% of them scored a two or higher, and the nationwide statistic in 2018 was um, 20 point, I think it's 21.7%. So we are above that national average, so that's a concern. So <clears throat> a lot of the children that we're working with are experiencing trauma. There's all kinds of different types of trauma. We talked about early childhood trauma. There's violence, whether it be domestic violence, exposure to community violence, violence within the schools, bullying, um, traumatic grief, abuse, medical traumas, sometimes ongoing medical traumas. We see sometimes kids with PTSD who are, are experiencing um, different evasive procedures that are ongoing even at young ages. And substance use disorder is another big one um, within the family. So when you're looking at treating trauma, and, and this is important to look at too as far as your assessment, and when you're looking at what type of intervention you want to utilize, you want to look at what type of trauma it is, whether it's a single episode or complex trauma. Many of the kids that, that um, I serve are complex traumas. I have very, very low uh, single incident traumas, but um, more of the kids have more than one trauma in different areas. So the single episode trauma is just one event that had threatened safety and security at some point in time, whether it's you know, a motor vehicle accident or a natural disaster or death of a significant person in their life. Um, that's a single episode. And then the complex or developmental trauma is are traumas that occur multiple times. So it could be the same trauma multiple times or multiple events. Um, these have long-term effects as well, uh, and it depends on, on the severity um, and how evasive they are. You're looking at child abuse, neglect, terrorism, domestic violence, um, ongoing substance use disorder, multiple caregivers, right, can be multiple traumas. Um, <clears throat> the biggest risk factors for PTSD is perceived threat of life at the time of the event, and fear at the time of the traumatic event. And if you think about this, this is really important. I mean, these are basic risk factors and when you read them, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But you have to put it in perspective of children. When you're working with children and young children, it's important to think about this and how they perceive pieces. So for example, I had a five-year-old once who witnessed domestic violence twice. Um, mom was getting away from the relationship. The dad had returned to the house threw a rock through the front door, shattered their entire glass front door, right? And so mom didn't perceive this as a huge threat because it was, it was a rock through the door. The child went to school the next day, the five-year-old went to school the next day and told his teacher that his dad threw a bomb through the front door and exploded the whole front of their house, right? And so to him, that threat to life was serious. Like that was what it was. And if you think about it, for a five-year-old to hear a, a front door shatter completely, a bang and then the, the door shatter, that, that could be a lot scarier than an adult handling that and somebody that's been exposed to that. And so his, his perceived threat was definitely greater than mom's. And so it's important to think about that from different developmental perspectives 
uh, and where they're at in that thought process. Some of the changes in the DSM, uh, PTSD is uh, classified now as a stress-related disorder, so it's no longer classified as an anxiety disorder. And they eliminated uh, the criteria of the emotional response at the time of event because <clears throat> people respond differently depending on their protective factors and what they've experienced in their lives. And so sometimes you can have kids who have been exposed to multiple traumas and um, then they're exposed to a trauma that, that may result in PTSD and not have very much of a response because it's something they've been exposed to, but this one had set them over. But their, their affect might be different. So that really wasn't an accurate criteria. Symptom requirement um, must be longer than a month and must be associated with a traumatic event or events that occur. And some of those symptoms, when you're looking at the symptomology, you're looking at affective symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and behavioral symptoms. So you wanna look at symptoms within all of those areas when you're assessing for PTSD. So if you think about it and you look at these symptoms, um, you can see where it's overlapping with some, um, with some other diagnoses. So for example, PTSD can overlap with depression. Both of them have sleep disturbances. Um, PTSD has little interest in activity and depression has little interest, lack of interest, reduced interest, um, you know, reduction in hope. And so that can overlap with PTSD. Irritability is also present in PTSD as well as depression and difficulty concentrating. And that one is kind of one that feeds into, and we see a lot of times, um, you know, PTSD misdiagnosed as ADHD. And many of the times kids who come in with PTSD um, are diagnosed with ADHD because some of those symptoms overlap as well. In PTSD, that, that difficulty with concentrating can resemble that inattentiveness that are, that's in class, that's present in class. And so, so it goes along the ADHD line. And then when you're looking at you know, PTSD has that, that automatic hyperarousal from the exposure to the traumatic event. So a lot of the times kids develop this hyperarousal and intensiveness. They pay attention to, to movement with around them. Um, they pay attention to activity. They pay attention to tone, voice, um, you know, nonverbal. So they're very aware of all this. This very much can resemble hyperactivity because if you think about a child in a classroom, you know, and they're hyper aroused, they're hyper vigilant of what's going on around them. They were recently exposed to a trauma. They could be fidgeting. They could be looking around. They could be really inattentive. They can be coming anxious from situations around them. That can resemble hyperactivity a lot. A lot of the, and you know, a lot of these um, can be ruled out by some screenings um, and assessments. I know for ADHD, one that helps me significantly is the Vanderbilt assessment skill. Um, this one explores parents and teachers' perspectives. And along with this, it helps really differentiate. It's, it's a little bit time consuming, but it can help differentiate between different diagnoses. So it really can help you kind of verify with specific behaviors that they're reporting at what category it kind of fits in. And if it is ADHD, what are some of the symptoms? And then so you can really assess and look at where it's overlapping in other areas. For young kids, identifying traumatic events can be really difficult. Kids have a difficult time understanding and expressing internal experiences. So because of their limited cognition, um, they have a really difficult time specifying what their traumatic event is. And even for young kids, you know, when you're looking at kids under five, I think we talked about this before, but traumatic events can be anything that, that had disrupted their lives. I had one kid that was completely traumatized by going to the bathroom. Um, if you've ever been in some of those public bathrooms, some of those toilets are really intense when you flush them. <laughs> and for a child, for a toddler who's just learning to go to, to, go to the bathroom, that could be traumatizing. Um, and it was for one of my kids. And so we, we had to work on that. He had PTSD symptoms every time he went to the bathroom. So, so it's amazing to look at the different cognition. 
Um, and kids don't have the ability to, you know, their cognitive capacity isn't an abstract thought. It's all that implicit memory. And so those memories, whatever their experiences are, whatever their memories are, they fire and wire together. So sometimes they can't even verbalize what their triggers are. Sometimes they don't even know what their triggers are, but they're just going to respond emotionally. And so that can be a really difficult piece in assessing children. Um, and one of the biggest pieces too is that caregivers underestimate children's ability to remember. I have parents, I just had one actually today, um, that her, her son was sexually offended when he was three years old and he's acting out sexually now. Um, and she's like, I just don't get it because, you know, he can't remember that. He can't remember what he did. I had to explain to her his capacity for remembering. They do remember, um, but not at a full cognitive capacity, right? They might not be providing logic to that, but they can remember events and triggers and sensations. And so they have some of those body memories and that's what we discussed. Okay. So for children under six, so this was like decades of um, research. Charles Zena did a lot of the research and Tringa, and what they identified was an alternative algorithm for children under six. So when you're looking at the PTSD diagnosis and the DSM, you're, you're still looking at the same criteria for, for um, access A, like the criteria for A. So you're still looking at the exposure of actual threat of death, serious injury or sexual violence, whether it's direct, whether they witness it, or whether they hear it or learn about it. And so that that is still criteria A. Criteria B is where it changes a little bit for children under six, um, because that's the criteria for intrusive symptoms. And sometimes their intrusive memories are different. Um, intrusive memories for kids under six can look a little bit like disassociation. Um, because of because we talked about that implicit memory sometimes this can come across in nightmares um, sometimes they can sometimes they can exaggerate like our five-year-old right their memories are a little bit different but it's how they perceived pieces um, so these intrusive memories are a little bit different along with um, the altered reactivity so so their reactions can be very different as well um, they can be more withdrawn irritable, a uh, little interest in things, or they can go to the other end, right? They can be hyperactive, you can see tantrums. Their reactivity can be very different to PTSD than, than in adults. Uh, the criteria for C, um, it's the same as the DSM, so the avoidance and um, the negative alteration of cognition or mood is the same criteria in the DSM, but you only need one for children under six. So you don't need both areas, you just need one of those areas. And so this alternative algorithm has been in play for about, um, wow, so for about like eight years in 2011 after it came into play. So it's been in play for a while. Now, I utilize, doing infant mental health, I utilize the um, diagnostic classification of zero to five. And so this expands a little bit more. This helps you look at um, the diagnosis in a little more depth and explores the entire unit, especially working with kids. <clears throat> the DC zero to five um, does a crosswalk. So after you go through the, the algorithms, it kind of identifies what the diagnosis is and what it would be in the DSM because it's not identified through insurances. So the, the DC zero to five, <laughs> looks at children becoming preoccupied with the event. They talk about, um, you know, play reenactments with trauma, how children reenact through play, how they reenact over and over again through play. They talk about um, repeated nightmares, specific nightmares, night terrors, hot flashes within the night. Um, they talk about how symptoms can interfere with daily activities, routines. You wanna look at all of these areas the child's development, so even assessing where their development is, and the family function. So you also want to look at the family function because um, the family interactions and the relationships are a big part when looking at that as well because when you're, when you're looking at kids under six, you're looking at some of that um, co-occurring symptomology. And so um, 
sometimes, sometimes parents and children can share symptoms or exacerbate one, one another's symptoms. Sometimes they can play off of one another's symptoms. So like, for example, if you had um, like a caregiver and a four-year-old child who were in a motor vehicle accident, right? Maybe nothing major, but just an accident, but very scary for that four-year-old child, right? They're alert, they're aware, they know what's going on. Um, they can't really put a whole lot of logic to what happened, so they might not understand exactly what was going on, but they can identify the danger and the threat. And so their perception might be different than their caregivers. Their caregiver might not see this as a threat or a trauma, but maybe the child does. And so what happens sometimes is that child's response to the trauma can impact the parent. So then the, the parent starts to identify that need within the, the child, and then they start to take on some of those, those emotions, right? So it's a, like a vicarious trauma. And it can go both ways. So if we did like another scenario where maybe a parent, maybe they witnessed a, um, you know, I had one parent who witnessed a, um, a, a violent crime and the child wasn't paying attention. This was in, a, this was in a, an urban area. They were playing on a playground um, and the child wasn't paying attention, but the mom witnessed it from across the street. So the child was really aware of the trauma. It traumatized mom. Um, and so the child was more aware when the police came and interviewed mom, when the sirens were about, right? When mom told and described to the police and then when mom told and described to dad when she got home. So the child would, became more aware of this. So the child actually started resembling some of the symptom, the symptomology of moms. Um, and so they definitely can exacerbate one versus the other. Once we started treating moms, his reduced, but um, we had to treat his as well. So when you're assessing children, you want to look at observable um, behaviors, uh, what their experiences are, how they interact, how they respond. Um, you want to do comprehensive interviews with all significant adults in the child's life. So you want different caregiver perspectives. Sometimes children can act differently in different situations, depending on the protective factors, what their relationships are like and what their experiences are like with those adults. Um, you want to try to observe them in more than one setting. So the rule of thumb is, you know, whether it's office setting, community setting, school setting. If you can't observe them in all of those settings, which, you know, in an outpatient center, I'm not able to observe them all. It's great to collaborate. You want to collaborate with some of those settings and kind of, I've even went through questionnaires with, um, you know, child care workers. I went through questionnaires with um, early Head Start, Head Start, and and so we've kind of assessed to see what their perspectives are as well. You also want to collaborate with any medical providers, school, if CPS is involved, collaborating with CPS, that can be beneficial too. Um, but areas to focus on when you're assessing young children, you want to look at their reactions um, between the child and the caregiver, how they're responding and reacting to each other. That's going to be a significant piece for the child to overcome um, any type of traumatic exposure. So exposure to a traumatic event, you know, to overcome that, they have to have good protective factors, right? And they have to have resiliency. And so you want to pay attention to that. Changes in a child's behavior. So you want to look whether there's significant changes. Sometimes, um, sometimes when those behaviors overlap, when you're looking at irritability or tantrums, tantrums can be one of those behaviors that produce after a traumatic exposure to a traumatic event. Um, you know, sometimes that's part of typical development too. So you want to see where the change of behaviors is in that time frame, the timeline. You want to look at the quality of the child's um, primary attachment because that's going to what that's what's going to help build those protective factors, right? That feeling of safety and security. So exposure to that stressful situation is going to be important for them to feel safe and secure at some point. And also looking at the resources in the environment that promotes resilience. Something. Stop. Good again. We can just hear. So, yeah, I'm right here. So if um, so, when you're looking at resiliency, what are some what are some protective factors that build resiliency? What do you guys think? Everybody's super excited to talk, right? <laughs> okay. 
make sure you unmute yourselves as well. Hi, this is Samantha. Um, so I just did that Connection Matters training and found out that these um, healthy relationships are, are very beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some of those healthy relationships? Well, it can be with anybody, um, especially a caregiver, but it could be with teachers or teachers or just anybody in the community. Yeah, absolutely. So those are protective factors. Those help build resiliency, building those relationships with any adult. And, and sometimes, even as a provider, you're that consistent relationship, right? Sometimes you could be a protective factor. I have a um, last night, this is so weird how it all just happened like today and last night, now I'm talking about trauma. So I have a little girl that I worked with and this is, the, this is the case that I'll be presenting next time, but this little girl came to see me when she was three, she's now eight, um, and she has post-traumatic stress disorder. This is <coughs> a pretty severe um, trauma case. And her parents had told her, you know, we're working on some serious trauma right now. And her parents had told her that she's probably going to go to therapy until she's 18. And so she came into me very serious last night and she said, can I talk to you for a minute without mom? And I said, sure. And so she came in and she said, mom told me today that I'll probably be in therapy until I'm 18. And I said, and she said, what do you think of that? <laughs> so I posted it back on her. I said, well, what do you think of that? And she said, she said, well, she said, I just want to know, is it okay if I see you after I'm 18? Will you still see me after I'm 18 if I'm still having problems? <laughs> so I said, absolutely. And she was very articulate in identifying that. She said, I don't want to tell somebody all of these horrible things over again, right? And so when you're working with traumatized kids, it's really hard to build those relationships and they want to make sure that they're holding on to them. So protective factors are important for building resiliency and resiliency is important for helping families stay connected and helping children overcome traumatic events. So when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at the protective factors, you want to look at um, concrete resources. We're talking about whether they need link to housing, um, DHHR, whether they need you know, transportation, whether they need childcare, whatever it might be, um, helping link them to those concrete resources are going to help build those protective factors, right? That's not a stress that that family has to worry about anymore. Strengthening support systems is another one. That's a huge protective factor that some people don't realize they have. Um, sometimes their support systems are unhealthy, so sometimes they have to find other supports. Many of the times families will come in my office and they'll say, I have nobody excuse me, and then we get talking and they're like, oh, well, I guess I have so-and-so and I guess I have so-and-so. So, and we talked about in here before about doing an, an, an eco map to identify those natural supports. Emotional and psychological resilience in the caregiver. So just like the, the, the dyad that we talked about earlier with the mother and the son who, um, the mother had to be treated and help the son's symptomology, you know, you're looking at, at their resiliency as well. You're looking at that because they're modeling that for their children. How they handle these experiences is going to be important because that's what their children are going to see and respond to as well. Um, parenting education, uh, parenting tips, parenting courses for caregivers. There's a lot of research on building resiliency with parents and just having them connect with one another. So having parenting support groups or whether it's the PTO or helping them get involved with any type of church group, anything within the community can help build that resiliency. Those are supports but also they're helping to identify with one another, to realize that they're not the only person that can be experiencing this, right? That connection is important. Understanding the child's social, emotional, and cognitive capacities. Many of the times for children who have um, PTSD or have been exposed to especially multiple traumas, you want to help parents identify where they are cognitively so that parents' expectations aren't too high and then moving forward, as well as social, emotionally. Like, how are they functioning? Sometimes, you know, a lot of the times, um, kids will resort back to behaviors at the developmental stage that the trauma occurred to when they become overwhelmed or high stress levels, right? So they might, they might resort to, I don't know, sucking their thumb or holding a blankie or sometimes baby talk, right? 
parents have a very difficult time with this. And a lot of the time, I'm helping parents just to meet that child's need at that at that point in time because and understanding that that's okay right it's okay if you have a nine-year-old that wants to coddle for a little bit and hold a blankie we're meeting a need and once we get past that her development will continue and so just kind of looking at those pieces and helping with some of those protective factors so resiliency is really important we talk about resiliency a lot we don't always go in depth with it um, and you know, despite difficult circumstances, kids have to learn to overcome pieces. And um, their resiliency is going to help provide that basis. So if they're exposed to a traumatic event, those protective factors and that resiliency is gonna be what helps them. So I'm gonna show you guys this short, um, this short YouTube video on, so for those of you who like Harry Potter, you will love this, but for those of you who don't know what Harry Potter is or don't even like it, you'll understand it. So it's, it's still understandable, but this is a great explanation on resiliency. I saw this at a conference. I can't even take credit that I found this. I saw this at a conference and I thought it was just fantastic. And it's a great, great way to show parents. And um, Ordinary Magic is actually a book and I wrote down who wrote it because I know I'd forget. Ann Mastin is who wrote it. Um, and it is a great book on resiliency. It's hot, it has great tips for parents. I have a lot of parents of adopted kids um, or kids with reactive attachment disorder that I have read this. It has great tips for them. Um, and it helps them identify how resilient you know, their household really is. So some people who, despite facing more than their fair share of obstacles, end up thriving and having really inspirational life stories? <laughs> Harry Potter is really the poster child for facing obstacles and overcoming adversity. He comes from humble beginnings, but faces many challenges and obstacles, but manages to overcome them all to defeat the evil wizard Voldemort. Oh, right. Um, spoiler alert? Harry Potter and characters in the wizarding world as a whole are actually great representations of some key concepts in developmental science. For example, sometimes when scientists want to understand a little bit more about how people's individual experiences affect their long-term outcomes, they'll use something called a risk gradient. Basically, in a risk gradient, we look at the number of risk factors, for example, the number of stressors, adverse experiences, or traumas, and chart them against the number of health, social, or emotional problems exhibited. For example, health issues, substance abuse, or delinquent behavior. Now, on a typical risk gradient, we'd expect that as your risk level increases, so too the number of problems or poorer outcomes that you exhibit in life. Now, let's unpack this with a few Harry Potter characters. Hermione. From what we know about Hermione, she had fairly few risk factors. She grew up with loving parents, had supportive friends, was smart, and worked hard. She also didn't express many problem behaviors, aside from the occasional rule breaking with her pals Harry and Ron. So we put her down here, low on both risk and poor outcomes. Voldemort. Good old Volby is, in many ways, the complete opposite of Hermione. He grew up in an orphanage with few friends or positive relationships, was intelligent, yes, but tended to prefer to use that intelligence to hurt rather than help others. This resulted in some, well, fairly severe problems and delinquent behaviors, what with becoming the biggest, baddest, dark wizard in history thing. Both Hermione and Voldemort represent what we tend to expect on a risk gradient. Higher risk equals more problems. Lower risk equals fewer problems. Now let's take Draco Malfoy for an example. Draco grew up in a wealthy family, was very clever, and had experienced relatively little adversity in his life, at least until he turned into a Death Eater. Life's pretty cushy when you're Draco Malfoy and your father's in with the people running things, yet Draco expresses more problem behaviors, difficulty coping with challenges, and again, that whole becoming a Death Eater and trying to kill Dumbledore thing. So he would be what we would call off-gradient, because though he experienced relatively low levels of adversity, he exhibits a lot of problems. Lastly, we'll consider the boy who lived. We know the most about Harry, and I'm sure you could come up with a laundry list of risks he experienced, so here are just a few. Death of both parents at the hand of the biggest baddie the wizarding world has ever known, blatant mistreatment by his aunt and uncle, some struggles in school, especially early on, and overwhelming expectations placed on him to, you know, save the world. No baby. Yet Harry manages not only to survive with his life, but thrive in his relationships with others, use his problem-solving and intelligence to get him out of several tight binds, and overcome and defeat the Dark Lord by the time he was 17. So yeah, he's doing pretty well. Both Harry and Draco's examples are unexpected. 
that go against what we would predict based on life circumstances, wealth, and experiences. So what is it about people who thrive under situations of extreme adversity that makes them different? Scientists refer to this ability to be able to recover and cope in the face of adversity as resilience. Now, it's important to note that resilience is not a characteristic that some people have and other people don't. Resilience fluctuates across the lifespan and is dependent on the experiences and the context surrounding an individual. Resilience is often dependent upon people access to what we call protective factors, that is factors that protect or support a person's ability to recover from a stressful life experience. So here are some examples of common protective factors and some Harry Potter characters who exemplify these characteristics. Positive consistent relationships with caregivers, relationships with other caring adults, relationships with close friends or romantic partners, intelligence, problem-solving skills, self-regulation, emotion regulation, planfulness, the motivation to succeed, belief in oneself, the faith, belief, or hope in a sense of purpose in life, effective schools, and supportive neighborhoods and communities. Now, some of these things you see pretty consistently throughout Harry's life. He's smart and motivated and driven and has caring relationships with friends and other caregivers pretty much throughout the whole story. But there are cases where Harry's access to these protective factors changes over time. For example, in the first couple of books, you see that Harry is generally supported by the wizarding community as the boy who lived and the chosen one. However, later in the series, that starts to change, and Harry is even sometimes perceived by the wizarding community as the villain. We see the role of Sirius Black's character in Harry's life as a parent-like figure and a source of support for Harry. We also see the crushing impact that losing Sirius has on Harry in all of the anger and self-doubt we see in Book 5. So much angst. Similarly, though Harry relies on his friends Ron and Hermione pretty consistently throughout the series, in Book 7 we see what a breach of friendship means for Harry's ability to cope with the stress of finding Horcruxes. The point is that throughout Harry's life, he learns how to rely on these protective factors to get him through the many threats and stresses that he faces. And sometimes when those protective factors aren't available to him, he struggles for a while until he's able to shift and take advantage of some of the other protective factors around him. Now granted, we are not all trying to save the world from the evil dark wizard like Harry, though sometimes it can kind of feel like it, but throughout our lives we go through periods where we're more or less resilient to stress. So for families and children experiencing high levels of stress and adversity, having access to the protective factors like the ones Harry has is essential to promoting health and well-being. And these are fairly ordinary things. They're not multi-million dollar interventions or magic pills or things that only people from specific backgrounds can have. And in fact, most of them are built upon or strengthened by the relationships we have with other caring individuals. And those people exist everywhere, and they're pretty ordinary. In fact, years ago, one researcher described resilience as ordinary magic. That is, that resilience arises from and in the context of these everyday, ordinary experiences. Now, that's not to say we don't need interventions or system and policy changes to enable people to more easily access protective factors in their everyday lives. That's a major need. But we need to remember that, like with the story of Harry Potter, that the magic happens in the most ordinary thing of all. Love and connection with others. What about you? What was the time that you were resilient during a really hard time in your life? And what protective factors did you rely on to get you through? Tell me down below in comments. And if you're looking for more of Okay, so we don't have to tell her down below or comment, but we now see how Harry Potter was resilient and what his protective factors were. So moving on to assessing for PTSD, these are just a couple of um, the assessment tools that I've utilized to assess for PTSD. The, and since I focus on kids six and under, the PTSD um, semi-structured interview is really good if you're not used to exploring that. It really helps you identify areas to explore. Um, the challenge working with younger kids, especially kids who are pre-verbal, is that they can't really express the trauma or what their experience was, right? Um, so hence the need for the interview of the entire uh, family system. So these assessment tools, you can find, so on the, the National Child, the National Child Trauma Stress Network, that, um, and that's in the ref, it'll be in the references, but if you guys have not explored that, you definitely should explore that website. Um, it is great 
as far as providing resources, references, handouts. Um, I think I've shared that before, but assessment tools, if I'm ever looking for a specific assessment tool and dealing with trauma or ruling out something, they have an area on their screening and assessments where you can pull up assessment tools. They'll help you identify what areas it covers, the age ranges they cover, um, the evidence base that, that the articles that have been written to prove that it covers those areas. It's a really great tool to utilize. Um, and also explores interventions as well. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the interventions that are used for trauma. When you're working with kids five and under, CPP is, is, can be really beneficial, child parent psychotherapy. There's not a whole lot of people who are certified in child parent psychotherapy, um, and that really helps the relationship and the, it focuses on that dyad um, in working through some of the trauma. The Child and Family Traumatic Stress Interview. This is a this is a brief treatment, but this is a great treatment. It helps um, families understand how how their child is expressing and experiencing the trauma, um, how they might be, and so it really works on how they're expressing distress and how each other can understand that. Um, and it really helps the families through a challenging time um, when they've been exposed to a traumatic event. Alternative for Families Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. This is an evidence-based practice that, um, that is beneficial, especially there's a lot of research around um, this being really beneficial for families who are struggling with a substance use disorder. So this is a, this is a parallel process approach. You're working, with, you're working with the caregivers and you're working with the child separately in this parallel process and then coming together. And so it's really beneficial, um, especially working with young kids, it's always beneficial to have a family approach. The reality is, is that you know, a traumatic event can really impact relationships. And even sometimes the smallest traumatic event can impact relationships. Parents have this protective shield that goes up around their children and they protect their children differently depending on the developmental stage they're in. So toddlers are protected differently than school age children and than school age children, than teenagers, right? So they're all protected a little bit differently. They're looking out for different things. When that shield is disrupted by the danger of a trauma or it's broken, then that impacts the relationship on both ends. And so it's really important to look at a family treatment because you're looking at a parent who now, if, if the trauma occurred to a child, you're looking at a parent who could possibly be exposed to trauma themselves or even vicarious trauma, and you're also looking at the fact that they have allowed this to occur to their child. Even if they didn't, that's a perception, right? It's, they've, they've broken that shield. And so for a child, it can be some of the same perception that you know, they weren't protected. And um, even if it was beyond that, that parent's um, circumstances, it's still important to look at that and explore that. So family treatments really are beneficial. And then trauma-focused CBT, um, that's the one I utilize with the little girl that I'm working with. Um, I do it like a modified version because I really struggle with some of the narratives for younger, younger kids, but that's um, exploring the emotional identification, um, defining the trauma, exploring the narrative of their trauma, um, storyboarding it out, and then having those conjoint sessions with the, with the the child and the parents, so bringing them back together. And, and a lot of the, so I, I just found out about, um, and many of you probably already know, about resiliency for Appalachia youth overcoming trauma. And that's, um, you know, Holly Sly is, is um, a coordinator of that who, who I've been in contact with. And ever since I found out about it, I've been reaching out to her all the time. But it, apparently, you know, there's, there was funding that came across to fund some of the the, count, the, the more southern counties in trauma-focused CBT and um, other interventions. I think parent-child interaction therapy was one too. And so I was really excited to hear about that because now I have places to refer. <laughs> um, and then one more. So risk reduction through family therapy. This is also um, an evidence-based one that's popular for, uh, for teens. Um, who have been exposed to trauma. Any questions? Tony, do you want, I didn't know if you wanted to include anything. Oh, hold tight.
Dr. Goody Kunz, I unmuted you. Is she back? 